Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Jesus had just heard about the beheading of his cousin, John the Baptist. Let's see what Matthew tells us comes next. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets in full, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the word of God, of life. Thanks be to God. I invite us to pray together, and as we do so, let us breathe. May we breathe deeply, breathing in the breath of life. As we breathe out, may we root ourselves more deeply in God's presence. Holy Spirit breath, feed us. Holy Spirit breath. Feed us. Holy Spirit breath. Feed us. Amen. Have you ever been part of a miracle? Now, I know that to our modern ears, we might have all sorts of questions about that, the scientific nature of it, how exactly do we find, define a miracle? Maybe I was part of it, but how can I be sure? Some of you know, certainly, you absolutely have been part of a miracle. Today, we have this miracle story. It's actually full of miracles. It's hard to even count how many miracles are in this story. It is um, perhaps it's, it's good enough just to talk about miracles as an inbreaking of God's kingdom, of, of somehow God doing something with ordinary things, ordinary people that is beyond our comprehension, behind, beyond our explanation, beyond us. Have you been part of a miracle? It's interesting to me how ordinary the things of this passage are in a lot of ways. Now, certainly there are extraordinary things, but there's a whole lot going on in this passage, and a whole lot of it is quite ordinary. Thank you, Helen, for reminding us. I was gonna, you, you, this is really important that John the Baptist had just died right before this passage. John had just been beheaded. He had been killed. And it was a traumatic and difficult thing to hear this news. Jesus and the disciples had just heard this news, and they responded to this by choosing to go away, to withdraw, to be someplace quiet on their own. Now, and again, some ways this is extraordinary, but don't we have times in our lives where we are um, just ready to be alone? We've had hard news. We've had um, things that have caused us grief. We are grieving, and we just need to get away for a bit. 
So Jesus went to the other side of the lake, and he was there on the Gentile side of the lake, outside of Herod's realm, and he was there, but everybody followed. All these crowds came right along. People, again, ordinary stuff in a lot of ways, people had needs. People were sick. People knew that there was someone who could help them, and so they came with all those needs, all those ailments, all that hope that someone could see them and help them. So Jesus was filled with compassion and um, healed them. And this is full of miracle, right? But this is not even the focus of this story at all. It's extraordinary. A whole crowd of people were, were healed, but we don't even hear any details about that at all. But what happens next is both extraordinary and ordinary as well. People didn't want to leave. Have you ever been in a place that you just didn't want to leave? Some place that made you feel alive and, and whole. A place that made you want to just linger, to not let that moment fade away. I remember coming home from my eighth grade summer mission trip with the youth group at my church. Something was awakened in me. It was an extraordinary week, and it was full of fun and laughter. It was full of hard things and stretching me in ways that I had never known that I could be stretched. I did things I never thought I could do. I was awakened not only to the fun and the, the extraordinariness of my own hands at work, but something was stirring in me that made me not want to lose this moment. I wanted to be with these people, doing these things, connected in these ways for a long, long time more. Have you been in a place like that? Have you been with people like that? Have you felt that kind of welcome? The people wanted to stay. At this point in Jesus' ministry, the crowds were following him, and they were huge, and they couldn't get enough of his touch, of his words, of his teaching, of his presence. They wanted to be with him. Maybe it says something about the welcome that Jesus offered, that they knew that they could come and be and be made more whole, be made more alive in these places with him. But on the other side of this was the disciples. The disciples were kind of tired. I imagine in my, at the end of my eighth grade mission trip, that first of many that I had taken, I, uh, I am sure that the, the leaders of this trip were pretty ready for us to go home. They did not want to linger in that space with me quite as long in the, in the ways that I wanted to. They were ready to go. They were ready to let our parents parent us. They were ready to sleep in their own beds, all these kinds of things, right? So we probably, be on, probably have been on that side of the equation ourselves, ready for the people to go home. And some of that's because we're tired. We get tired when we lead, when we serve, when we give of ourselves. Even when it is beautiful, we know that there are moments that we might be just ready to leave, to stop, to rest. We don't have anything left to give. So the disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, I don't think these people are going to leave until you tell them to go home. Will you do that? Will you tell them to leave? They don't, probably didn't bring food with them. They're going to get hungry soon, and they can go into the villages and, um, and, and buy what they need. But Jesus says, no, let's, let's let them stay. Let's keep them here. Things are good. Let's feed them. Actually, disciples, you feed them. Disciples look around and they say, but Jesus, we have nothing. We have nothing but these five loaves and these two fish. Remember, by the way, that there are six versions of this story in four Gospels. This was a really important story, but they all come with different details. And in this story, it's the disciples who have the bread and the, the fish. And they look at it and they say, 
there's nothing here, Jesus. There's nothing here. You wonder in this moment what they must have been thinking about. In Jesus, what was filling Jesus' mind, what was filling the disciples' minds. See, as I was telling the children, feeding people is a big thing in the Bible because it's a big thing in our lives. Augustine says that we may not be able to live, um, hold on, I'm going to get this wrong. We, Jesus, in the, when he was tempted in the wilderness, said, I can't live but by the word of God, right? He was tempted to turn stones into bread. He says, no, I, I rely on God's word. That is what feeds me. Augustine says, yes, that's true, but if we don't have bread, we will die. So we need food. We need it. We need it. And in the wilderness, in these desert places, we know that food can be scarce, that water can be scarce, and it is a big theme in Scripture. Where will the food and the water for God's people come from? You recall those scenes in the wilderness after the Exodus, when the people just kept complaining and complaining and complaining. They could not trust that God would feed them in the wilderness. They could not trust, even after it happened, over and over again, they could not trust that it could possibly happen more. God, where's the food? Where's the water? In Psalm 78, it's talking about, again, how short our human memories are, how short our trust in God is, how short our trust in God's provision is. And it talks about the people saying in anger and in taunting of God, God, can you set a feast, spread a table in the wilderness? Even after God has done it over and over and over and over again. So the disciples in this moment may have been saying, God, can you spread a table in this wilderness too? Eating, being fed by God, is also in Scripture about the incoming of God's kingdom. We hear in Psalm 23 that God does spread a table before us, right? There are so many ways that that trusting that this can happen is a way of trusting in all of God's provision, all of God's kingdom right here. So Jesus says, take this little bit. I'm going to take it. Let me take it. Let me bless it. Let me break it. Let me give it. You recognize these words, not just from what I said to the children, but from every time we take communion together. It's echoed not only in the the Eucharistic passages, the Last Supper stories, where Jesus sits down with his friends for a last meal together, and he takes bread. He blesses it. He breaks it, and he gives it but it's echoed also in the Lord's Prayer. We can hear those same kinds of words there, that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And this is even how Jesus was recognized in a resurrection appearance to the people at Emmaus by the taking and blessing and breaking and giving of the bread. This was such an important moment. And even if the story stops there, in the midst of this very ordinary extraordinariness, even if it's all about food, even if it just this little bit of sharing helped all the other people there to share more of what they had, even that is a miracle, and that is enough. But Henry Nouwen invites us to think about this in an even more extraordinary way. He says that in Life of the Beloved, he says that that this is not just something, not just a miracle for us to observe or to receive or to experience. It is something that happens to us, in us, that we are what Jesus takes and blesses and breaks and gives to the world. And that in doing this very thing, taking us and blessing us and breaking us and giving us, that that the kingdom of God is at hand for each of us, for all of us together. And this is how we know our belovedness, how we live our belovedness. 
Can you imagine this? Maybe you've experienced this. Maybe this is the miracle that you thought of before or can think of now. Jesus takes us. Jesus welcomes us, says, come, stay, abide with me. Takes us in Jesus' hands. Takes all of us, including those inadequacies, including those things that we're not quite sure Jesus wants to have or know about. Jesus takes us, even when we're sure there's certainly not enough of us to feed anyone to help anyone, much less this great big world that overwhelms us with its need. Jesus takes us, all of us. Jesus takes us. And then Jesus blesses us. Jesus gives thanks to God for us. Jesus infuses us with divine energy, divine love, calls us holy and sacred, says there is enough of you here. And then Jesus takes all of our brokenness and puts it in that light of blessing. Jesus takes all those parts of us that are hurt and wounded, the parts of us that have made mistakes, that have failed, that have woefully been inadequate, Jesus takes all of that and blesses it, takes those broken parts of us. Jesus takes whatever little bit we are willing to offer, always inviting us to give of our whole selves, but taking whatever we're willing without forcing. And in Jesus' hands, it becomes different. It becomes more. It becomes transformed. And in Jesus' hands, we are given to the world. We are given. We are given in ways that we might not have ever imagined or dreamed. We are given. We are given out of our belovedness. We are given in ways that heal and feed and serve. We may look around in our lives, in our pocketbooks, in our bank accounts, in our pantries, in our reserves of our energy, and we may be like the disciples. There's nothing here. There's nothing here but a few loaves of bread, a couple of tiny fish. But Jesus says, let me have them. Let me take them. Let me take you. Let me bless it. Let me break it and let it be for the world." And in Jesus' hands, we no longer have control over how it is given, how we are given. We can no longer control how many people will be fed, how extraordinary the blessing of us can be to this world. So friends, as you come to this table today, may it not just be a bit of of gluten-free flour and water and dough mixed together and some grapes that have been juiced But may we come with ourselves, trusting that Jesus welcomes us, takes us, blesses us, infuses us with divine energy, breaks us open, breaks our hearts open for the world, and gives us that is what's happening in this meal today. May it be so. Amen.